All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast and happy St. Patty's Day. This is our Sunday uh, St. Patrick's Day episode. And in honor of that, we thought that we would do a movie from China about the Japanese occupying China with a guest who's from Texas because it all ties together. Uh, and we'll get into that. We'll introduce our guest, Luke Tatum of the Culture of Peace Podcast as soon as we get into the last night's portion of the show, Moments Away. But before we do that, I want to say hello to Robert. And uh, what do you got for my actual Anarchy audience that we want to not necessarily share with the Last Nighters audience? Anything? Anything? Uh, I, I deal best when asked a direct question. I don't know if I just need to come up with some bullshit on the spot. I, I, I don't know what you want. I, w- I just want something primo, like yeah. that shit ever, for our mm, anarchist audience. No pressure. That the Last Nighters people just won't get. Maybe something they wouldn't mm. understand anyway. Donnie Yen is a badass... But Master Ip is kind of retarded. How about that? <laughs> All right, we can leave it at that. So we'll do a little more uh, actual anarchy at the end of this. But uh, let's get into that last night's portion of the show. And we will introduce our guest, Luke Tatum of Culture of Peace. Here we go. Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, The Last Nighters, and The Last Nighters is part of the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Check it out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. They've got tons of different shows, new content coming out every day, uh, a wide variety of things, and it's a uh, it's a good group. So check it out, thelaunchpadmedia.com. Tonight, we're doing episode 63 of the show. This is going to be coming out right after St. Patrick's Day, and we're doing a movie from China, uh, talking to a Texan. It's Ip Man uh, from, I think, 2010 or 2008. I, there's, there's conflicting information on the Googles, but uh, I thought it was earlier than that. It was like 2006 or 2004. That's what the Netflix said. Yeah, see, it's all over the map. I'm getting all sorts <laughs> of different stuff. And apparently there's a, a show, like a series, and then there's like um, another competing franchise. So it's it's really kind of out there. It's kind of confusing. So It Man's like this hot property. It is the hottest of the hot. Well, he is basically a superhero. So I can see why there would be like a Marvel version of this guy. They'd want to franchise him out and do all kinds of different properties with him because he's essentially unstoppable killing machine. He's Robocop pretty much. He is. Yeah. You can take on as many martial artist guys as you want, and he's going to take them all down with pretty much ease as long as he's a little bit pissed about it. That's right. Yeah. So just so uh, our audience knows, we had some pretty stellar pre-show content that's available for our Patreon supporters. So do check that out at lastnighter.com slash Patreon and uh, give us a couple of dollars and you can see the glory that is the pre-show. We also do co- uh, Kathleen Turner Overdrive called KTO, which is bonus content for after the episode is over. But let's introduce our guest, Luke Tatum of the Culture of Peace podcast. How are you doing, Luke? Tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where they can find your work, uh, why you recommended this movie. And then we'll do the Google description and get into the analysis. Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me on. Glad to be here. My name is Luke Tatum and my website is LukeTatum.com. So that's where the Culture of Peace podcast is for now. I don't have a separate website set up for it or anything. Uh, So it's all all right there at LukeTatum.com. Just kind of a libertarian interview show. Bring on different people that are doing something good because I know there's a lot of negative libertarian things to say out there, you know, all the federal overreach and all kinds of bad stuff. So I just try to focus on good things for a little bit. And so that's a lot of fun. I've been doing that for about a year now. And then I thought this movie would be fun because I remembered seeing it maybe two, three years ago, something like that. And it's got kind of a, uh, I think you can make a case that it's got a libertarian feel to it. Um, I remember thinking that when I saw it. And now that I've watched it again, I think I still have the same opinion. So it's kind of that non-intervention, you know, withholding your aggression kind of a thing. Um, you know, it man, the the main character, he's uh, he's willing to use force as necessary in defense, but he's not 
you know, he's not starting fights, right? So I thought that was kind of an interesting starting point. There's plenty more we can say, but we'll get into it from there. All right. That sounds great. So people can check that out at LukeTatum.com. That's where your show Culture of Peace. I actually heard you on an episode with Dan Reed of the Culinary Libertarian uh, not too long ago, and it was a really good episode. We you. heard some of your origin story. Um, there's something about trying to find raw milk or you were getting raw milk and then that was getting shut down, something like that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, libertarianism, you know, comes at you in the weirdest ways sometimes. So just trying to find some good old unpasteurized milk and at an event at that farm where we were buying it, they were having uh, different speakers and different presenters out there. And one of these guys was talking to us about Ron Paul, who actually supports raw milk and farmers' rights and things like that and not getting raids by the FDA. So I said, okay, that sounds pretty interesting. And weeks passed, then I end up on YouTube looking at Ron Paul videos and the rest is history, right? As they say. Well, we'll post that on our show notes page, your uh, culinary libertarian appearance. And uh, why don't we get into the Google Descriptione here for Ip Man. So here we go. It came out on here. It says 2008. Uh, sports drama, one hour, 48 minutes, eight out of 10 on the IMDb, 85% Rotten Tomatoes and 59% of Metacritic. So pretty big disparity there. However, 90% of Google users like it. It's a very brief description. It says, the life story of Yip Man, the first person to teach the Chinese martial art of Wing Chun to Bruce and Bruce Lee's trainer. trainer. Um, oh, okay. So it says it was made in 2008, but release date September 21st, 2010 in the U.S. So it probably got um, released in China previous to that. So it's got one of those, like, took a couple of years to make it across. Probably needed some funding, some kind of sponsor. To- well, there is some pretty hilarious dubbing that goes on in this movie. Oh, so okay. did you watch it with the um, the subtitles on? Well, I'll, I'll I'll do you one better, Robert. I watched this on Vudu in Chinese. You watched it on Netflix. Apparently, the English dub version. Yes, I did. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see some contrasty stuff here, Luke. Uh, which <laughs> version did you watch? I watched it actually both. I listened to the audio in Chinese and I. I watched the subtitles as well, and there is a lot of discrepancy between the two. Okay, interesting. All right. Well, um, Luke, what we usually do is, what are your thoughts on the uh, description before we get any further, and then we'll go to Robert and start diving in. On the description? Yeah, yeah, what the Googles had. Yeah, what was was that? Was that it? Yeah, that was it. The story, (laughs) the life story of Yip Man, the first person to teach the Chinese martial art of Wing Chun and Bruce Lee's trainer. So absolutely nothing to do with the movie itself. Okay, well, then I have not much to say about that. (laughs) <laughs> well good enough good enough it's a good uh, reaction that's that would be my reaction it doesn't say anything about the film and i wouldn't it's not even his entire life story it's just a i don't know maybe like a five to ten year period of his early life right yeah well then you got it man 2 and it man 3 it man the final battle uh and a few others like the return of it man mecca mecca it man it man goes to space it's my Freddy favorite. versus it man <laughs> All of those things. All right. So Netflix actually has a little bit more information on this. It says, um, an occupying Japanese general challenges Chinese men to duels to prove the superiority of the Japanese, but Ip Man refuses to fight at first. So that gives us a little bit more to work with. So Luke, your thoughts on that and then we'll go to Robert. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a little bit more meat to it. I think that's a fair summary of the movie. The Of course, the, for, the first section of the film has nothing to do with Japan at all. It's just establishing the characters. And in some ways, that's kind of the most fun part, where it's just the hijinks around the town with the martial artist coming in from, I guess, a neighboring village. I, I wasn't clear really where he was coming from, but someone coming in and challenging all the masters in the town and just setting up Ip Man as kind of being a superior fighter, even amongst martial arts masters. But from there, sure, it goes into the Japanese occupation and really highlighting the brutality of that period of history. I think it talks about how the population of the city where this all takes place dropped from 300,000 down to 70,000. So, you know, just genocidal type action happening. And it's it's almost like two different movies in a way because of the major shift. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. It did seem like they were weaving a bunch of different stories together. And they were sort of loosely related because it's like the same guy, but it's really a disparate in sort of the flavor of it. But I, I think that they are trying to establish who you who this character is in that first you know third of the movie, and they needed that long to do that. You know that he's this master, but he's humble and he's not willing to um, instigate things, and he's very cautious with 
people's um, pride and and uh, being, you know, there's a certain code of conduct with people like they do private fights and, and that's not supposed to be spread out there because that would hurt another person's reputation, things like that. And so there's a lot of different things that I want to talk about related to that portion. And then you get this uh, Japanese occupation stuff, which is, of course, horrific, um, but it turns more into an action movie, I think, at that point. Uh, Robert, where do you want to take us from here? What's your uh, reaction so far? Well, uh, the, there's a bunch of different things, like you said, with the uh, the reputation and the economic angle. That was uh, a lot of fun. It didn't want to make it public, and he respected the, the guy. The guy lost, so he didn't want to hurt his business. That was the primary thing. Even though he claims to not know anything about business, the whole movie. But the main thing I want to say about the um, the Google description is that it mentions that the general wants to prove the superiority of the Japanese people through this martial arts. I didn't really get that. I got more that he wanted to establish the superiority of Japanese martial arts, which is more like a Japanese like karate form versus the Chinese Wing Chun form of Kung Fu. Um, however, if you look back at the World War II history, there's definitely no shortage of the indoctrination of the demonization of the Chinese as, as a lesser people, as less than human. And then that allowed for all kinds of atrocities for the, for the Japanese military to uh, perpetrate in China. I mean, they didn't even see them as, you know, barely human, like subhuman. So they're just like, well, I didn't just kill another human. I just put down, you know, one of these mongrel people. It, it allowed for all kinds of horrific things. And that's what states often do. I mean, when you're demonizing an enemy, you create an enemy, you create animosity between two people that would otherwise have zero animosity, have zero reason to go across the sea and murder somebody else. Now, all of a sudden you have this reason you hate this other person for all they're doing is like defending their own homes. So yeah, there's all kinds of different ways we could do it, but those are my original initial thoughts. Yeah, and I think we actually do see a fair amount of that. It's like they try to play this fine line between them being treated subhuman and them showing respect. It was it was a little bit weird. And I don't know if if this movie was made in China per se, because wouldn't they have kind of more restriction over what could be talked about in, in the movie if it were produced there? I mean, there's actually a lot of like pro-entrepreneurial stuff going on in here. The guy's opening a factory, uh, things like that. So I'm just wondering if that's like, is this a subversive film, do you think? I, I think it's very pro-Chinese. Uh, it's very definitely written from a Chinese perspective in that Ip Man is like the superhero character, right? They can take on 10 fighters at a time with ease. Um, and, and, re and remember that any movie that comes out of China made it past the censor board and has gone through all the, you know, the edits and the script changes and whatever that the Chinese censors have put on any, any media. If you're watching any kind of movie or playing any kind of Chinese video game or whatever, it's all gone through the, the censor boards. So this is officially approved government movie. So I would have to say it's fairly non-subversive. Although, because, you know, there are fairly amount of capitalistic notions in China. I think they recognized the wealth that it creates for the most part. I mean, it's still a socialist hellhole, but they've brought in the past, what, 10, 15, 20 years, billion people, or mil hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Daniel. I agree. I agree. Circle gets the square. Not through their socialist communist bullshit, but by letting them have some freedoms, some industry. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean, we're not still, I'm sorry, every time you start to talk, I like start, I get another thought. But, you know, it's not like we're still during the like great, great leap forward of, you know, you know what Mao's and whatever. We're not all living in the, in the rice fields. There are plenty of people producing lots of good products and materials and content. Right. And then we can also see similar to what happened in uh, Weimar, Germany, where the destruction that was wrought after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles damaged the country, damaged the people. And that led rise to a Hitler. Um, and then, of course, World War II. And, and I see a similarity with what was happening to the Chinese here. And then the rise of Mao after World War II. Sure, the people are dispossessed, right? They're they're looking for a way to solve the problems that have been facing them for, I guess, years, right? Several, quite a period of years that they were enduring this kind of subjugation. And then, of course, the way that the war ended was sort of bad for everybody. I mean, nuclear, the, the nuclear option deployed for the only time ever, um, withdrawing the Chinese, I mean, excuse me, withdrawing the Japanese and kind of having to reevaluate their situation. It just, I mean, where do you go from there? Imagine the United States, if you have, say, a foreign army, let's not use a specific one like Russia or something, but an army in there with military bases, with troops literally marching down the streets all the time. You have to get out of the way, make room for their military buggies and things like that. And then if they just pack up and leave and they're the ones giving you scraps of food, that's a pretty hard reset button. 
For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to uh, bound back from that. Um, now, I don't know if we want to get into this, but the Chinese people as a whole, it's hard to talk in non-collective means, were very much a not technologically developed country for a very, very long time. And it's only been in the past 40, 50 years that they really have kind of joined the first world. I mean, there are still like people in rickshaws and whatnots when the Japanese invaded. They were very much technologically outclassed by this invading Japanese army. So they were kind of humbled really quickly. I mean, you're talking about a country with, you know, multiple times the population, China to Japan. I don't know what the, the population at the time, but it was probably, you know, seven, 800 million versus Japan's, I mean, Japan's the size of like California. I can't imagine they had more than 20 or 30 million at the time. I don't know. I don't, I'd have to look that up, but I mean, just getting completely destroyed by this tiny little island nation has got to be humiliating. And then, yeah, so Chiang Kai-shek and Mao and those guys all came back and kind of roared back. Kind of, yeah, it, it allowed a lot of angry, hungry people, a banner and somebody to get behind. Exactly like Dan said, as, as the Germans did with Hitler. And Well, all right. Well, let's um, let's talk about that first third of the movie because there were a couple of elements that I thought were pretty interesting. And I'll let you guys bounce off of this for a moment. So we open on the citizens of Foshan. They're prosperous and practice Kung Fu as a hobby. The martial arts clubs are opening up all throughout the city and new competitors are trying to join in and they need to challenge the existing best person to prove their worth and attract students. And so I saw this as a parallel to competition between various uh, entities in, in industry, trying to attract customers, trying to get the best product out there, prove that they're the best out to, you know, sort of like advertising to you. And then we even see the, uh, the guys coming from another town coming to do basically the same thing, but more with brute force. And that's like a precursor to what happens with um, the Japanese occupying force. But uh, did you guys see any of these sort of competition and entrepreneurial action going on in that first part of the movie? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Luke. Well, it's uh, it's like Billy Mays or somebody, right? He's coming in here showing you how OxyClean works. And, you know, it's amazing. Look at me. I can clean any stain. And then you should join my school. I mean, you know, that's kind of a leap. But it's uh, it's very, I guess there is a lot of entrepreneurial spirit throughout the whole movie. But it, it sets the tone early on with this kind of, uh, you know, just show the efficacy of your product. In this case, your martial arts training. And of course, I guess the the city is known for a wide area across a wide area for its Kung Fu and for its martial arts training. And then you have tiers even within that. And yet they're all still around. It's not as though there's one one company or one martial arts school that is the only place people are going. It's still a flourishing, prospering economy. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that because they have sort of this, you know, variety available and all the schools seem roughly equivalent. As far as we know, Ip Man doesn't have a school of his own, but he's recognized just kind of on the streets as the best. Um, and then when uh, Master Liu tries to start up a, a school, he goes and challenges to the private duel with Ip Man. But when the the, the guys from uh, the northern the, the northern uh, kung fu style they come in to fight the southern style of kung fu, and they just kick everyone's ass, and they just want to like dominate and just show that everyone else's schools are garbage. And so it's a big disruption, right? These guys are coming in to a market and like trying to show that the current things that are available to people are just no good compared to what they've got to offer. And I'm not sure how to look at that. Like, is that like, is that like some upstart competitor that just has some killer, uh, great product or a really great price coming in and disrupting something? Uh, or is this something that's more aggressive and nefarious? I, I tend to think of it as a normal competition. This is, this is what probably every, these other guys did before they were established. I mean, this, this, it's funny because this is the kind of thing that still happens today, very much so. Just except the masters themselves don't fight, their disciples fight. And we watch it all the time in something called a UFC or professional boxing. It's, it's whoever's trainers, they train fighters and then they, fighters come together and we see who's the best. And if their fighter continually wins, they'll attract more clients. It's, uh, it's something that's been going on for a long time, but they didn't have TV and the UFC back in the day. So they actually had to go out and mix it up in person. But I think it's very much a, like they're portrayed, like the guys that come in from the out of town are portrayed as these violent thug guys, but not initially. I thought they were pretty much, I mean, they're going around challenging people. People were free to, you know, not challenge. I think it was the culture at the time was very much, if you were to say that you were a, a master of X and someone came along and said, 
well, I'm also a master of X. Let's see who's the best. It was pretty much, you know, you're, you're getting called out and it's time to put up your shut up. And so a lot, I think the culture was that they would, and it was just seen as a kind of friendly competition to see who's, who's got the best juju. And uh, yeah, uh, only later on when they're turned into this thieving band of thugs, are they actual villains but even then it's i'd say the real villains are the japanese because they're kind of not necessarily they have acting to there's a there's a scene in the movie where he's like i, I don't want to be bullied i'd rather be the bully than be bullied and i'm not excusing you know these thugs that are going around attacking people but certainly they wouldn't be doing that had the japanese not invaded yeah i think that's true but i think that their thug turn comes earlier when they go to Ip man's house and refuse to leave and then they finally get Ip to fight him and he's losing, right? And then he cheats and pulls the sword with that wicked move out of the holster, like out of the sheet. Yeah, he's pretty badass. With his heel. And, and tries he beats him with a feather duster or whatever yeah. that was. Yeah. And I mean, that's that was he was cheating and then attempting to murder him. <laughs> it was no longer just, hey, we're going to spar and see if my northern style is better than your southern style. Right. Yeah. His, his thuggishness is revealed when he refuses to leave and then yeah, he cheats. But I think he, I mean, maybe he was a thug all along, but I don't, I didn't have any problem with initially going around and challenging other masters and then beating the crap out of them. Yeah. Now, what did you think? And I'll go to Luke with this. When he lost to Ip after doing this cheat move, he loses with the feather duster. Um, he, he explains to Ip, oh, your southern style beat my northern style. Like the guy wasn't taking the personal responsibility for losing the fight. He was blaming it on some third party thing, right? Like this thing over here is why we lost or why. Right. I like, lost. yeah, I just took the, lo- the wrong class. That's that's why <laughs> you got lucky and you picked the right class and I got wrong and then I picked the other guy. Right. That's kind of the, you know, born into privilege argument of the left. I, I would liken it to that. I mean, it's not exactly, but, you know, oh, you were born or you were raised in a better environment and you had more access to opportunity and therefore you won because of those reasons, not because I haven't worked hard enough or I haven't perfected my technique. And so I just, you know, that again, I think it reveals the personal character flaws of the challenging Northern thug. You know, he's, it's, it's all building his character. I, I like a lot of that character development in, again, in the early part of the movie, which just continues to play out for the second part, you know, after the occupation. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think that it's it's not really that there's a shift in his character. He's kind of the same guy throughout the movie. Um, I think he would have continued to simply challenge Masters in a more respectful way as long as he kept winning. But it's because, you know, whenever his back's against the wall that his real character comes out in that scene. Yeah, it reminds me of when I was a kid and I got like a new pair of shoes and then I, we were like out running around and like raced my friends and they said, oh, you only won because you have those new shoes. <laughs> that actually <laughs> happened. That's, that's like that childhood mentality. What kind of shoes? I don't remember what they were now. They're probably like New Balance or something. Who, who knows? <laughs> but they were just new. And so that's why it allowed me to run faster. My daughter has sure. shoes that she got a while back and she called her them her super fast running shoes. Because they were running shoes, and uh, she likes to run around and pretend she's a cheetah, and also a dog. She does a lot of different stuff. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to bring up before we get into the occupation stuff was I want to talk about the cop, because he becomes a bit of a traitor, as Ip calls him later on. But even early on, when there's the altercation at the restaurant about the guy's reputation, and you, you can't own a reputation, so that's a little bit of an ambiguous situation for me, like the the younger brother who lost his kite and saw the fight and then told everyone about it. And he's like, well, it's the truth. I'm insist- you know, like, why wouldn't I be able to tell the truth? And uh, I think the guy's name is Ju says, uh, well, it's my reputation. You're, you're sullying my reputation. But anyway, the, uh, the cop comes and breaks it up and says, you know, if you guys don't listen to me, I'm going to throw you all in jail. And he points a gun at it, man, like totally not the safe use of a gun. He's not apparently doing any firearm safety at all. And if just like dismantles the gun right there, but it made me hate this cop right away. Yeah. In his defense though, the cop was only wearing, you know, he only had a, a prop gun because there's no way you're going to push the cylinder out of a revolver just by using your fingers and have it go flying out of the gun like that. Well, it's that good. It's just that good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, the cop was a piece of crap. It's true. And then he later on becomes the translator, right? 
Right. And there's another responsibility situation there because he's like, I needed a job and I'm doing this thing. And it's like, you're a traitor, man. You, you, you see what's happening. They're taking these guys in, beating them up and killing them. And I, the guy was basically giving the, oh, it's just just doing my job argument. And that's what, you know, all the um, soldiers in Germany said uh, at the Nuremberg trials. Right. But he wasn't. I mean, he was maybe facilitating that occurring, but he wasn't responsible for the Japanese general or like, I don't know. General Attaché or whoever was that little mousy guy that the colonel people. Yeah, that was the colonel. And, you know, he had the he shot the the, um, Jew in the head after he lost to like three guys and he was picking up the bag of rice, which was an amazing shot with that pistol at that range, by the way. Yes. But his punishment was admonishment. Like you just murdered the guy. Well, don't do that again. (laughs) Don't do that. Not in my dojo. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I He's garbage. He's a garbage human for sure. But I don't know if I'm going to extend that. I mean, it's, I think it's a fairly powerful argument by the translator at that point where like, what am I not supposed to be able to eat? Should I not? I mean, he's got a specific, specific set of skills, right? He can speak Japanese and Chinese. And this seems like a, the best situation he could do at the time. It's not like he built the situation. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's almost like working for the government or, you know, because you're facilitating it. I think we talked about this in... Um, our episode, we did one on war dogs and we were talking about how he was selling the military like linens and towels and things. And we we're at the time we were like, well, that's still helping perpetuate the war, right? It's providing things that are needed for them to be able to do what they're doing. So it is facilitating and you do bear some responsibility. I don't know if it's like the same thing as you murdered that guy, but you do aid and abet in a way. You are making it easier for them to go and commit these things like if there was okay, no wait, translator, wait if there was no translator how are they going to get these guys to come in and fight granted but those guys voluntarily joined came in to fight in the promise of getting some rice to feed their families which they actually did receive when they were victorious that's true it's a little different from say a roman coliseum or something where you have like literal slaves being brought in to fight one another to the death they did sign up for it in some sense I mean, they are victims of this situation. Right. These guys, I mean, they're desperate, right? Because the, the Japanese army has choked out and stolen all the wealth from the area. So they're basically destitute. So it's kind of like, okay, we're giving you this option to get your rice back that we've already stolen from you. It's not they, um Right. Yeah. They remind me, or the situation reminds me a little bit of like the puppet dictator type character that the U.S. will create in these Latin American, Middle Eastern countries where, so you have this person who is a native to the country where he's governing, but his loyalties are with the United States. And I know that the police officer character is not, you know, loyal to the Japanese, but he's he's helping them achieve their ends. And so, and his role is to be the voice, you know, I'm one of you, I'm a Chinese man as well. And this is what, you know, our next level up leaders, the Japanese are telling us, that we need to do. And, you know, I'm empathizing with you being from the same nation. So you should, you should follow these dictates. So I think there is some moral responsibility there. Yeah, I can agree with you. I don't think that they can do what they do without that guy. Right, right. Well, but wait a minute, though, this, this wasn't like their entire effort in this city. They were an occupying army. And this martial arts fighting was like a diversion that the general was taking part in, like separate or like, you know, it's not like if 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 the the translator guy wasn't there, they wouldn't still be occupying the place and robbing and stealing and killing Chinese people. But you're right. They would have a harder time getting people to come in and fight them with their Kung Fu. But I would argue that the, them getting them to fight in their, their Kung Fu was the least terrible thing that the Japanese army was doing in that city. That's probably true as well. Yeah. I mean, if I can pull in some Nanking references, and I'm not saying that the Japanese army that was in this city was also in Nanking, but the Japanese army in Nanking were having beheading contests, which with victims reaching into the hundreds, they were sicking dogs on tied down men. They would bury men up to their necks and set their heads on fire. They would rape women, cut their heads off and shove spears up inside them. They would do all kinds of horrific things because, you know, committing rape in the Japanese army was illegal. But if you didn't have anybody to accuse you, then it was fine. And they also didn't have necessarily have a uh, policy to, hey, let's go rape and kill everybody. But they had a take no prisoners stance. So when Japanese or Chinese army people would surrender to you, well, what are you going to do with them? There were mass graves where they massacred tens of thousands of people. This is... 
is brutal, horrific war. And um, what what what's presented in this movie is probably the tamest thing that happened in China at that time. So that's it. All right. Well, now now that you mention all of that, and I'm sure there's a Dangerous History podcast like episode or series that we can link to that talks about all that stuff. Hard, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, Hardcore. Supernova in the East is currently being put out right now. You can listen to it for free for now. If you wait too long, it'll go back into the back catalog and then you'll have to pay for it. But right now, part of the free episode, Supernova in the East. Okay, we'll post a link to that. And yeah, when you put it that way, in light of a terrible situation, it's sort of like... It's sort of like the government, you know, they'll, they'll break your legs and then sell you a crutch. It seems like that bit of a scenario a little bit where the Japanese occupation is making everything terrible. And then they're giving them this one opportunity that is less bad compared to all their other options that are still left to them. Right. Now, I, the, the general guy, I f- saw him as sort of one of those um, sort of deviant types who escalates. Right. Like the level of... Um, evil shit that he does grows and grows as we move along. And his his attache, the colonel guy, he was already nutso, like right off the bat. Yeah, he is a psychopath. I mean, he saw the Chinese people as less than human for sure. Had no no compunction for killing them for even touching him, right? Like it like hits him one time and he's like, well, I'm going to execute this guy right now. He touched me. And the way he interacts with those children whenever he's coming into where it man is living, um, you know, using his actual gun and pretending to shoot at the kids and things. That's uh, it's a stomach turning sequence. Was that that same guy? I, th- I know that was one Japanese soldier. I don't remember that being um, the colonel guy. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. It is a, it is a different guy coming in there. Yeah, because it was like three of them that Ip Man beats up when they right. like, leer at his wife. And right. gonna, he's going to go and like rape his wife, probably. And Ip's like, I ain't having none of that. You can eat my fist, though. Yeah, I liked how angry he would get, like, but a very concentrated anger. You know, it would just they show close up of his clenched fists, and then he would just go and just straight kick some ass, super <laughs> superhero style. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a series of uh, Chinese video games called Romance or uh, Dynasty Warriors, and it's all about kind of the romance of the Three Kingdoms heroes. Um, I can't think of one, a single one, off the top of my head for some reason. I don't know why. They're very famous character, Chinese folklore kind of heroes that really did exist during the Three Kingdoms period. But you play those, and it's like if you're one of those guys, you can just slaughter thousands of men no problem it's just you're so skilled that you might as well be some sort of superhero yeah and isn't it a weird dichotomy where they denigrate the other people so the japanese are saying that the chinese are subhuman but that gives license for the japanese to act in a subhuman way it's it's a weird like self-fulfilling prophecy and then of course the japanese were caricatured by um you know, cartoonists and whatnot in the U.S. when World War II happened, you know, they were denigrated and dehumanized. And it's like this vicious cycle. And it, you're right, it does make it easier to commit atrocities, but also to act in a manner in which you're sort of projecting on the society that you're denigrating. You know what I mean? Like it's giving you the, I guess, it gets you over that cognitive dissonance in a way of, well, now I can act this way because they're less than human but that's giving them license to act less than human. Am I making any sense? Yes, yes, yep. and I, I agree. Um, it's it's an interesting thing, like you say. It's it's I can act this way because the other people are already acting this way. Therefore, we're justified in sinking to their level in order to eliminate them. As though after that, you all just can miraculously go back up to your moral high ground without you know carrying that shadow along with you. Um, and then you have people with PTSD and all kinds of other terrible post-war troubles uh, because they've done horrible things. So it, it's like you say, it's a cycle. All right. I want to talk about another hero in this movie. And that is Ips. Is it his brother-in-law, the guy who starts the cotton factory? Because he sees early on in the film that Foshan is, um, is, that, is that the name of it? Foshan? Yep. Yep. Is uh, doing well. The economy is doing well. And he says, people have money to spend. And when people have money to spend, they're going to want to buy nice clothes and You're going to need cotton for nice clothes. I'm going to open this factory. And then after the occupation happens, most factories get shut down and there's mass starvation. Like you said, like two thirds of the population flees or is murdered or starved. Um, He had also fled the brother, brother brother-in-law, and he comes back and his, his reasoning is, I can still run this factory, even though the equipment's outdated, it's still somewhat effective. And otherwise these workers here wouldn't be able to eat. So he's doing it to provide opportunity in a good way, using his entrepreneurial activity to help the uh you know the the workers that are being harmed by this occupation right much the same way that maybe a person in venezuela who's able to actually start and run a business or a person in north korea who can start and run a business is doing really heroic work 
right? They're they're helping people who are in dire need. And, you know, even without the self-defense things that come in later when Ip Man comes to the factory, it's still, it's giving them a means to resist the abject humiliation of, you know, starvation and death. And the uh, the loss of quality of life is just, you know, astounding compared to how they were living before. People are giving free gifts to Ip Man in the first part of the film because they have abundance and everything's wonderful and they've fallen so far. And it gives them a way to survive and have some dignity. You know, they're doing something productive. And so in some sense, you know, those people are doing a lot better than the ones who are going to fight to get rice, right? They're not having to subjugate themselves to the brutality of that situation. They're just, they're doing honest work to get some food to feed their families and survive as long as they can. Speaking of that, can we start talking about Ip Man's strategy on feeding his family? <laughs> I knew you'd want to go there at this point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, okay, Ip Man is like a stoic, right? He's like some sort of stoic ideal of like the guy that nothing ever gets to him and he doesn't complain about everything, anything at all. Yeah. And that's fine. You can be a stoic, but you can't be a shitty father and a shitty husband. When you have an opportunity to work at this factory that you own a stake in, why wouldn't you, when you've got a starving family at home, instead you take a job shoveling coal and you can bring home like half a yam? What the hell, man? Daniel, I know you got thoughts. I know you've, you you called out Will Smith in the pursuit of happiness for being a bad father. So you can talk about this now. Well, yeah, I think, I think this was pride getting the better of him. He didn't want to um, take a position in that factory because it would have been seen maybe as like a privileged thing or like taking an opportunity from the the workers there who, uh, you know, they were trying to feed their families or whatever. I don't know. It's kind of this weird thing. I mean, he should have just gone to work there. I mean, why not? Well, there's dialogue, right, where he's saying that I forget what character it is, but someone says that he doesn't like to owe anyone any favors. So I think he would feel as though his his brother-in-law or brother was doing this for him, giving him a job that he otherwise wouldn't have been able to get. And he would have been taking advantage of the situation in some way. It's not fleshed out, but there is one little snippet in the movie about that. Right. But but right after that, he goes to the guy hiring for coal workers. And there's this crowd of people saying, pick me, pick me. And the guy sees it's Ip in the crowd and picks him and says, oh, Master Ip. Yeah, True. come on. Up. So True. he did get that job because of who he is. And hmm. it's not like he didn't have a stake in the company. He loaned the guy money in the beginning of the movie in order to be able to start that factory. Yeah, I feel like they're weird about money in this movie. Like, Ip is like, oh, money's not important. I have some. I'll give it to you. You don't need to pay me back. Right. But he's also, you know, everything just rolls off his back. And So, Daniel, he's a father with a family at home. Is he doing the right thing? Is he a good provider for his family? Well, in those circumstances, I think that he should have worked in the... Uh, cotton factory that he owned a percentage in. Now, I want to hear you denigrate this guy. You called out Will Smith in Pursuit of Happiness for being like a total piece of shit. So I want to hear you say Ip Man's a total piece of shit. Well, there are some things that Ip does, especially when his son wants to show him like his artwork and stuff like that, that are, you know, not super father of the year type stuff. But How about not feeding the kid, huh? Isn't that a little bit more important? Yes, not feeding him is pretty important. But he was still feeding him. Uh, the half a yam. Okay, they were pawning right. stuff, right? And then, yeah, then the half a yam. And then uh, then he got into these tournaments, got into the fights. And then he didn't even take the 10 sacks of rice that were thrown down when he beat all those guys. He just took the one bloody bag and gave it to uh, the other guy's family. Right, as a statement. Right. Now, he was making like a principle of point instead of being humble and being like, you know what, this 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 rice would really do a lot of good. Yeah, he's like, fuck your rice. <laughs> I'm just here to kick your ass. Right. And I there's a certain part of me that's like, yeah, right? Fuck these guys. But the other the other side of me is like, but the realist is like, but that rice is gonna fill my kid's belly and my wife's belly, who's sick maybe and you know needs the calories. Didn't yeah, we watch you... Matt remember when we watched uh, Barefoot Gen and Gen was running around in uh, Hiroshima and his mom was like sick and she like needed some calories. Wasn't that, is there, that was in the beginning of the movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing happens in this. Um, the wife is very sick and he makes her some kanji and, try, and he says, you know, this isn't quite the great consistency, but you got to try to eat it. And so, yeah, I mean, he, it's, it's a, it's a, you got to have certain tensions in this movie <laughs> based on the script. I mean, if he just worked in the in the factory, you know, there wouldn't be the uh, confrontation with the general and all the rest of it. And he, he also, you know, doesn't get to make that point if he doesn't turn down the rice and say, I'm just here to kick ass. I'm all out of bubble gum. I'm just here to kick ass. Yes, it's true. It's probably a better movie for his bad decisions. I don't want my protagonists making all perfect decisions and being perfect characters. It's more interesting when they're not. But I still want you to call him out when he's being a crappy father. Come on, Daniel. Yeah, I think covering for him. 
He's being a, a bad dad. He's a bad dad. Bad, bad dad. Good. But I think he's Thank still you. he's still a decent guy. Oh yeah, he's not. I'm not saying he's not a bad guy. He's still the hero of the movie, and I think he's a good one. Yeah. All right. So Robert, you are sort of I don't know. I view you as the comic book slash martial arts slash certain you know certain genre type stuff nerd. Yeah. So how does the kung fu fighting strike you in this? Everybody was kung fu fighting. I um, but I mean, it's a lot of it's fantastical. Yeah, it's 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 there's a lot of wire work, but not as much wire work as like a crouching tiger, hidden dragon style fight. It's more realistic in that sense. Um, you know, Donnie Wen, Donnie Yen is a very talented actor. He has been in multiple fantastic martial arts films, and he's actually, I would say, he's probably a better martial artist than he is an actor. But it's hard for me to say because you know I can't I can't appreciate his acting chops in the his original language. So. Um, I, I, I don't know if he's like my favorite martial artist. I think like, uh, like a, a Jet Li or a Jackie Chan might be just a, a, a little bit more my, my style. Like, you know, Jackie Chan, not to totally go off on a tangent about martial arts movies, but Jackie Chan would be more of a human character. He definitely brought the humanism because he was a, a reaction to all the martial arts movies where the hero is this invincible Iron Man guy where he would get punched and just not even feel it. And you're like, just keep on coming. Who cares? You're nothing to me. And that's very much the the trope in martial arts films up to Jackie Chan, where Jackie Chan, and I don't know if he had inspiration, it's that whole Hong Kong school where he would take a punch or he would punch a guy and then he'd be like, ouch, my hand hurts because I just punched a guy in the face and that hurts. And that, like, no one had ever done that before. I mean, it seems old now because Jackie Chan's been doing it for like 40 years. But, you know, Jackie Chan and I would say even like Tony Ja with um, the Protector series out of Thailand, they had ways of making fights really, really interesting. They would use the environment a lot, especially Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan was known for like really encompassing all kinds of things in the environment, breaking windows and tables and chairs and fighting with, like he does, like like the guy does with the feather duster in this movie, but more so. Like, yeah, anyway. Anyway, so uh, I think he's really good, really strong. I wouldn't necessarily put this movie up to the level of martial arts like in the Pantheon, I would put it just below the Pantheon. I think it's excellent, but not the best I've ever seen. Okay. And did it bother you at all? The little tiny fists of fury thing he would do every so often, like his little signature finishing move. I thought that was great. I thought I, it didn't bother me at all. I'm glad he did that. Cause it kind of gave a little bit of personality to his style. Cause otherwise they're just kind of doing cuts and moves and whatnots. And at least that's a memorable thing that he did. And I think he just did it to this for this character. I don't think he does that in other films. Okay. Cause when I saw him fight the 10 Japanese guys and he's doing that to one of them, there's like four guys standing around him. I'm like waiting for him to finish <laughs> punching that guy 500 times. Yeah. This is the time to strike. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> All right, Luke, your take on the uh, the martial arts in the film. I like that it's not quite so crouching tiger, hidden dragon, as Robert said. It's it's a little bit more restrained. It's you know to some degree you have to have some fantastical elements to make a fun action movie. You know, no one w would watch The Matrix if it was you know just like a a wide angle shot and you just watch people fight at regular speed, right? There's there's got got to be things that bring out some extra character to it, and so there's enough. For me, I think it's at a good level. I'm going to agree it's not, you know, the top martial arts film that I've ever seen. It was fun. I like the story more than I like the fighting. But uh, but it's, you know, it's enjoyable and well executed. It has aged relatively well in the last decade since it came out. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. It's a good watchable action film. It's not like the same trope over and over or something. Yeah, it felt like there were a lot of interweaving elements going on in this. And like they set that stage in that first third, and then it's almost like a separate movie. But mm -hmm. it's also sort of necessary to get to know who all the players are and, and what their motivations are. So I kind of give it a lot of credit for that, actually. Um, is there any other points you wanted to make before we start to wind down and do our final summary and review, Luke? Well, sure. I, I, I do have this interesting point, and you'll have to tell me if you agree at all, or if this is just me going off on my own thing here. But at the beginning of the movie, I kind of likened Ip Man's behavior, you know, his his concern for the respect and well-being of other people, and not wanting to offend their reputations and all that. That's sort of how I viewed the Ron Paul runs for president in that he wouldn't, you know, go after people. He wasn't attacking their character. He wasn't tearing other people down, running negative campaign ads. He was just saying, you know, this is who I am. This is my my take on things. And you can take it or leave it. You know, some people did, but not everyone did. And that was fine with him. You know, he wasn't he wasn't proselytizing and evangelizing and going out there 
um, in a in a negative way. Do you see that at all? Do you see what I'm saying? Or is that yeah? You never sense? you never saw Ron Paul like attack ad that you see from all these other politicians all the time. So I appreciated Very that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was he was all about the issues. It's all he was all about the principles. That's what's so great about Ron Paul. He wouldn't get into hey, do you want to talk about how so and so is wrong about this and wrong about that? And he's like, no, nah, not really. Let's talk about what's right and wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And Trump had become the master of that, especially within debate. <laughs> Of of the opposite, you know, of doing the complete teardown. <laughs> yeah, he would absolutely belittle you. Yeah. And he won. Um, so I guess that's <laughs> what the electorate is at, I guess. It goes to show the effectiveness of the political system we have. Yeah, name calling gets you elected. Sweet. Yeah. It's like high school. It's great. Only the stakes are a little higher. Um, but yeah, I, I do uh, I do think that's a good point that you make, Luke. And interestingly enough, had Ron Paul not done that, we would not have been doing the show together because I think we were three people who that rang true with his yeah. message. Yeah. So if anything, I think that he was effective in, in that regard of what do they call that? The remnant of awakening the remnant a little bit. Yeah. I can't remember right now off the top of my head whose article it is that the remnant is coming from. Uh, who wrote that? Was it? I think it's a biblical reference, but I am not the guy who would know about that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, all right. Well, uh, any other points, Robert, on your notes or anything from Ip Man before we do the wind down? Well, I do want to mention just how much I appreciate, you know, I've been into martial arts since I was a young man. And there's something absolutely very libertarian and cappy about martial arts in general in that, you know, martial arts was originally... I believe and this is maybe this is like a folklore story. I don't know, but I believe it to be true that martial arts were originally invented by Chinese when um, carrying weapons was outlawed. And so they learned how to fight with their hands. And that's, you know, maybe me like the first like style of martial arts was invented, not necessarily fighting, but um, the idea that it's a defensive force and it's and it's been passed down ever since then to only be used in self-defense and that's always been the thing that you know, kind of attracted me to it you know like, no you shouldn't just go around beating up people you should use this you have like it's like a skill it's like a skill that you've put time and energy into and you developed you kind of formed your body and your abilities into a weapon and it should only be used to defend yourself for others and that that has been you know stressed throughout you know all like martial arts masters and dojos and whatnot so i don't think they there's a single one maybe cobra kai cobra kai is the only one where they talk about you should go out and sweep the leg but everybody else is larusso much... was the bully in that yeah that's a that is there's an excellent youtube video that pretty much breaks down how he was the bad guy in karate kid <laughs> you should put that in the show notes page yeah and i think we should do karate kid at some point but um yeah to your point i think that it man is the embodiment of what you're describing where he is very highly uh toned in in his abilities like he's very specialized he practices constantly to maintain peak performance levels but he's also only using it defensively and like that's his whole style is to deflect and then respond to attack. And it shows how humans won't be put down by, you know, tyrannical regulation. Like you take away our weapons. Well, we're still going to find ways to defend ourselves. That's a good point. Uh, Luke, any, any comments? No, I, I agree with 100% with what Robert is saying. And it's just, it's good to see those kind of principles laid bare in a film because a lot of action movies, that sort of thing, it tends to just be about, well, who has the bigger guns and who has you know, who's the protagonist, basically, whoever has the, you know, the story driven right to win from the outset. And there's some of that in Ip Man, but I think it's more saying, you know, this is the principles that he has. There's that great line after he wins at the end of the movie against the general, you know, about the Confucian nature of his martial arts. And he's, you know, it's, it's, it's not about being aggressive and taking things over. It's about winning whenever you're forced into a situation that requires you to use force, you know? So I, I thought the whole movie did a really good job of encapsulating that. And I just appreciate it. Yeah. Now I, there are sequels, like as we kind of joked about in the beginning, um, has anybody seen those sequels? I have those are available two. on Netflix. Yeah. I've seen two and three. Um, one of them, I believe it's the third one is by a different director and it was very different and I did not really appreciate it at all. Um, the second one was quite good though. And I could be switching them. It might be two that's bad and three that's good, but I did watch them both. No, you're, you're right the first time. Two is pretty good. Three has Mike Tyson who's not very good. <laughs> 
are they worth doing or have we kind of tapped out on it man here uh they're probably worth watching for entertainment value and especially three if you're a completionist i don't think we would necessarily need to do an episode on part two or episode two or whatever but okay. they're still you know if you're looking for something to watch on a saturday night why not sweet put it on while you're folding the laundry yeah Exactly. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention was I found the music in the score for this movie to be pretty, pretty good, pretty compelling. And it was like a lot of the samey kind of thing. But I mean, you're kind of into it by the time the, uh, the second hour rolls around. <laughs> I was a big fan of, of the music. Nice. Yeah, I, it was good. Yeah, I, I didn't quite notice it a whole lot, which means it didn't stand out in a bad way. But it, I felt the right emotions when I needed to. So I think that it does its job. All right. Well, why don't we continue on into final summary and review? Uh, Robert, why don't you go ahead and then we'll go to Luke. All right. So Ip Man in 2008, you know, I'm not a few, I'm not a fan of Chinese censorship. And there is a serious problem. Like, it reminds me of, um, there's a famous Chinese director, and I, I have no idea what the guy's name is, but I read an article interviewing the guy, and he was talking about um, Kung Fu Panda, when Kung Fu Panda came out. And he said, you know, this is a movie about Chinese martial arts, and we could never make this movie, because this movie wouldn't make it past our censors. And he's like, that's a terrible crying shame. And, you know, I can't do anything but agree with the guy. Um, anytime you've got some bureaucrat deciding what is good and bad art and what is allowed and what isn't allowed. It's like they don't even allow, you know, movies with like pictures, you know, ghosts in the movies because I, I don't really know why they're afraid that the Chinese audiences will get confused and think that they're real or something. I don't know, but they don't allow any kind of movies with ghosts in them. It's hilarious. But all it does is stifle creativity and destroy, you know, innovation. So it's a fantastic government as usual but this movie um it made it out through i don't know if this is the original intent of the creators or if this you know has been gone through in multiple revisions due to government censorship but um i do appreciate donnie yen i think he's fantastic i i i I don't remember the first movie I saw him in when he was just a young martial artist guy. But the first time I saw him, he was so dynamic. Um, I think he was in Iron Monkey. May maybe that was the first time I saw him. Maybe not. I don't know. It's been a long time. But every time I see him, he's always fantastic. Um, it's hard, though, to comment on the acting because it is, you know, I don't get to hear the inflections. Well, I didn't. I listened to an American dubbing, which was hilariously bad. There's especially one little girl. If you listen to it, this little girl is clearly like some staffer's daughter that they brought in to say one line. And it was like she couldn't really read, so they had to tell her, you know, what to say. And she still messed it up really bad. And then that was like the best take, and they went with it. It was really bad. Um, and overall, the dubbing was pretty terrible. But, you know, so I generally prefer, you know, the original dialogue, the original actors, and then to watch, to read the subtitles but i was lazy this time and i didn't do that or well it was the only thing available to me on the netflix so anyway or at least i didn't even check and see if there was a different audio track which maybe i should have but that all said um this is definitely a recommended film um it talks kind of in a roundabout way and kind of like glosses over a really horrific time in human history um if you're interested definitely read uh the rape of nanking there i guess there's going to be a movie a new movie out focusing on an actual a Nazi, a Nazi priest, I believe, who saved a whole bunch of lives in Nanking during that time. And I don't know who's in it. I think it maybe it's Christian Bale. I could be wrong. Don't take my word for it. Look it up for yourself. But uh, this is a this is a good movie, and uh, it's definitely worth a watch. And it's a martial arts movie, and it combines like political history and world history, and it uh, checks all those boxes for me. So I'm going to say this is like a seven point two. Good flick. Check it out. All right. So, Luke, what are your thoughts? And then a score out of 10. Sure. So one of my favorite things about this movie that I had not mentioned yet is the set design. I thought it was a very well presented film. And I think that's characteristic of a lot of Asian uh, pieces generally. But, you know, Ip Man's house had a lot of character, the the contrast between uh, the city before and after the military occupation. There's a lot of good things in there. There's a lot of shots, just close-ups of like the barbed wire and things like that, that really set the tone. It's got that filter on there, that kind of gray filter to really make things more gritty. And uh, I, you know, I like those kinds of things to really heighten the difference. Uh, it does gloss over the actual brutality of the period a little bit, but I think keeping it hyper streamlined and just focusing on the, focusing on the martial arts aspects made it a well-paced film so it didn't turn into a kind of preachy thing at any point where it's just like look at how bad things are let's spend 10 minutes on how bad things are and so i appreciate that 
as well. I mean, there are films out there to do that. If you're wanting to be in the worst possible mood that you can put yourself into by just absorbing the worst that humans can inflict on other humans. But uh, this is, you know, it kept the theme on the martial arts throughout. And so it's just a kind of a hyper focused thing. And I like that. Uh, soundtrack, as you mentioned, is great. Not something I would listen to in my car, but, you know, good for what it was, what it, what it was needed for. And really help build the scenes, the acting and the costume design that kind of goes into the set design. But uh, um, the characters are really distinct. That northern aggressor who comes in, who's kind of a thug, you know, he he really stands out. And so I just, you know, I really appreciate the little aspects of the movie and kind of brings it all together. It's a solid seven for me. Wow. I can't believe you two hated this movie so much. This is uh, this is John, Donnie Yen is a stud, and the kung fu in this is amazing. I found this movie to be very entertaining and very complete from like the story uh, and character development all the way through. And so I go with, like with a nine on this. I love Ooh. it, man. This is a great movie, and it's good. It is good. It I'm is just, good. I have very high standards, and I love that you call the northern style guy the northern aggressor. <laughs> <laughs> it's Being a civil, civil war nod, yeah, civil war nod. You know, it's uh, the war of northern aggression. Uh, but anyway, uh, now we're not going to make it past the censors here. Um, but Luke, thank you so much for being our guest on the last nighters. This is episode 63 of the show and the people can find the show notes and more at last nighters.com slash 63. We'll have links to your, uh, your website, also your appearance on the culinary libertarian. Um, a couple of, uh, other things that we've talked about today on the show. Um, is there anything you want to add? Uh, what can they find? What what uh, What's your favorite, most recent episode that you've done on your show? Well, uh, again, I'll just direct everybody to LukeTatum.com to find my program, Culture of Peace. And gosh, a favorite one that I've done recently, I just had Daniel Berman, who is running for president uh, in 2020. Like, it seems like there are hundreds of millions of people running for president now. I, every time I open any browser, there's a new person running. But uh, he's going to be running on the Libertarian Party ticket. And, you know, I'm not really a political guy. Uh, but I did have him on to just kind of talk about things, what he would do if he had the white house, that sort of stuff. That was a lot of fun. And I think he does a a good job of at least spreading the message. So even if not, you know, taking the white house, implementing and Kapistan, it's still, you know, it was a, it was a fun conversation. And I think that's maybe a good place to start if anyone is checking out my show for the first time. So that is the first one when you go to my site. All right. Sounds great. And thanks again for being our guest. Now, Robert, we're going to have another guest next week. Uh, This will be Dark City with Nikki P from Sounds Like Liberty, who is also on the Launchpad Media. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I haven't watched uh, Dark City in a long time. So hopefully uh, with my new uh, ANCAP eyeballs, I'll be able to see some new interesting things. Yeah. And uh, one of our former guests, Mike C., he's actually watching the live stream right now. And he mentioned that Dark City is a masterpiece. So it gets me excited to watch that one and uh, hopefully have a very good discussion like we had tonight. So, Luke, thank you for joining us on this episode of Last Nighters. And uh, we'll say good night from last night. All right, a few more minutes with the anarchists. So, Luke, I didn't mention it, I think, on the last night, but you are known as Anarchist Luke Tatum. Is that correct? I am, yeah. My Facebook page for a long time was just Anarchist Luke Tatum, and it's amazing how much of a stigma that has because when I changed the page to Culture of Peace podcast, then my growth started to explode for that. So even though I did the podcast for a long time before, uh, I was like, still, people have that kind of twinge of... I don't know what it is, uh, reluctance to click on something that has the word anarchist in it. So I still embrace that title and use it frequently, but uh, that's not something I would put in your URLs. Um, although I, I'm sure you know about that from doing actual anarchy. Yeah, this is actualanarchy.com slash 120, the show notes yeah. page for this one. And yeah, I think I think you're right. It, uh, it attracts um, an odd sort and repulses most others. <laughs> I like it because it sounds dangerous, but it scares away a lot of people. Right. And then uh, as anarchist mom can attest to, you get a lot of the left style anarchists who want to break Starbucks windows and have universal basic income and things like that. Yeah, which is awkward. And then, you know, I I try not to ban people from various pages on social media and stuff, but it's like 
okay, you, you might be in the wrong place. You know, <laughs> um, we're, we're not really talking about those things here. Get your patchouli stink out of my store. <laughs> Another movie we need to do at some point. That's a movie line? Yeah, that's from High Fidelity with John Cusack, Jack Black. Oh, yeah, you've mentioned that one in the past. You haven't, I don't think you've mentioned that quote before, but yeah, that's you Tim Robbins. wanting to do that one. Yeah, yeah, he's got the ponytail like me, um, and he's like a spiritual type, like hippie yoga type guy <laughs> wearing Birkenstocks and having the <laughs> rings on his fingers, and Cusack is having none of it because he thinks that he's dating his girlfriend, like who just broke up with him. Anyway, you, you do look like you smell like patchouli. Oh, that's not patchouli. It's uh, probably <laughs> probably one of those crystal deodorants. You know, like Bernie says, you can't, you shouldn't have more than one different variety. And so apparently, I'm not using one that would be state approved if Bernie were president. How how much of a chance do you think he really has? At well, least a fucking white male. So zero zero percent chance. <laughs> I, I I unless something really happens, I see Trump repeating. I don't know. I yeah, agree. I yeah. I think that if the economy, if they if they start putting that in the media as things are bad, then they pin that on Trump. But I mean, it al almost always is the economy and uh, we're doing great. I mean, jobs are keeping, you know, according to government numbers, which are completely all massaged to death. But you know what I'm saying? Like if, if there is a crash, I, I could see it. But other than that. Yeah, but we still got a good, you know, 18 months before that's in play. Or yeah, but they're already starting to campaign. Right. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't matter until early November. Fair enough. Well, I mean, who do you see? I mean, wasn't someone going to Gabbard or whatever her name is? Someone's going to primary Trump, right? In uh, the Republican side. I forget. I, I think I saw something that was like embarrassing. Was it Weld? Bill Weld? Is yeah. It? Really? I think he said he was going to primary Trump. Sweet. I don't see that going well, but <laughs> <laughs> libertarian for life, Bill Weld, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um but yeah, so Luke, yeah, having anarchists in the name, I think it does scare a lot of people away. That's why we tried to do the last nighters portion to be more appealing to the uh, to the normie style people. Um, it hasn't been super effective yet, but we keep plugging away. <laughs> well, how about being on Launchpad? I mean, surely that's been a big thing for you. Yeah, the Launchpad has been really good. Uh, they've got a pretty big audience, and so we get some good download numbers through that. Um, we we're hoping to see some crossover benefits, but I think that if somebody has already heard us on <laughs> one version of the show they're not going to come back for the five minute longer version right that we're on here the actual anarchy podcast but you know i, I think that uh we have grown the show uh through partnering with them um and and that's been good and um i think a lot of this is a long game you know you just keep um consistently putting out content and improving as you go you'll eventually find your audience and grow it and so that's at least what i tell myself <laughs> So that's our strategy. That's mine too. I mean, it's it's not anything that I could uh, make like a large revenue off of at this point. But the show Culture of Peace started, I guess, the 6th of March last year. So just barely over a year old now. And it's doing okay. You know, I, I, it's more than I thought would happen. Yeah, that's good. Now, where did you get the name from? Because when I Google it, um, I find it's a UN thing from 2011, maybe some initiative. So nothing to do with the UN, of course. Uh, I was just struggling to find a name that did not contain the word liberty or the word anarchy. I wanted to do something that wasn't horribly, horribly overdone. Um, so, you know, we have many, 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 many liberty-related products and services and websites out there after the Ron Paul uh, movement kind of wrapped up after he stopped running for president. And so it was more of a reaction to that. I thought, okay, if we take the Murray Rothbard position that the war peace question is the whole thing, you know, you, if you, you have to start with being anti-war in order to get to the other parts of libertarianism, then I'll do something that focuses on being pro-peace. And we also talk a lot about culture. And I know Dave Smith and, and Tom Woods and all these people are always talking a lot about the culture and how it's just so completely inverted from what it should be. It, you know, I just married the two terms. So, you know, absolutely nothing to do with something that's already out there, like the UN. Um, and, you know, it's probably not the best name for a program that I could have come up with given enough time, but that's what I picked. <laughs> so there we are. All right. Well, I didn't mean to besmirch it with the UN. Uh, nah, you're good. World government. But yeah, I think it's I think it's a good name and it's a good mission, you know, a good a good message. I think the war piece question is is significant because war is so often used uh to be waged domestically to be able to project it out uh internationally. I think that was a Ron Paulism, right? You said you have to first threaten the people <laughs> at home to fund the war machine. 
and right. then project it out into the world. And so, yeah, I think that is that is probably the most important question. I think the Federal Reserve is another important one, is, as is education. But I didn't want to do the Federal Reserve because then if you have a show that's like, you know, I, I can't think of one on the spot, but some kind of anti-Fed name, I just don't think that would attract any listeners. You know, think, oh, okay, uh, great. I'll scroll on by. And what would you do when the Fed finally does go away? You'd have to change the name. Right, right. <laughs> anyway. We can all hope. Yeah, maybe one day. Those are good kind of problems to have. Oh, no, I got to change my podcast name. <laughs> I got all this much extra money. All right, guys. Well, let's uh, let's wind this down. Maybe do some Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is available for our Patreon supporters at uh, actualanarchy.com slash Patreon. The show notes and more for this episode can be found at actualanarchy.com slash 120. Our guest has been Luke Tatum of the Culture of Peace. You can find his work at luketatum.com. That's T-A-T-U-M. That's the last name, luketatum.com. And uh, we'll get in some Kathleen Turner Overdrive. Thanks for joining us, Luke. Thank you. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 In 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com.